Now I've come back today, uh, a week later, uh, from our actual excursion that we came here uh, with uh, Lifelong Learning Piap, because when you're with a group of people, it's difficult to, you know, get a clear shot, or it's it's a bit rude to start talking with a, you know, a, a vlogging camera in front of them and, and uh, giving your own spiel about uh, what you are recording and that sort of thing. So I've come back here today, an actual fact, I've been back here, this is the third time I've been back here, um, to try to record something to make into a video to explain what you're able to uh, receive in information from such a, an organised tour with Evergreen Tours or indeed with lifelong learning uh, PIAP courses. We were so fortunate to uh, have uh, a, a learned guy explain things to us. Well, it's, His it's name, a real Professor Arjan Jack Eisner. Now, this temple, Wat Muen San, was actually built in the early 1400s uh, by the eighth king, apparently, of the Meng Rai dynasty. And his name was King Sam Fang Kam. Now, the name of the temple, which is uh, Muen San, actually originates from the monks uh, that were here when it was built, uh, apparently because Moon means 10,000, that's the ranking of the monks that uh, deal with uh, royal documents, and royal documents are known as San. So the monks at the time gave the name of the temple. Well, Chiang Mai was actually well placed uh, for the IJA, the uh, Imperial Japanese Army, uh, because it had a railway line leading up to it from the south, and also it had an airfield, uh, so they could uh, get their resources in and out, their armaments, their troops, their supplies. And uh, this temple uh, was just one uh, of the commandeered uh, locations within Chiang Mai, uh, commandeered by the Japanese, to serve as A, a field hospital, and B, as a prisoner of war camp. Now apparently the prisoners of war here, uh, numbering around about 46, uh, according to records and um, uh, some things that uh, we, we were shown in the overhead, um, overhead uh, presentation by Jack Eisner this morning. Um, those uh, prisoners were taken from Singapore when the f fall of Singapore uh, early on and also um, from uh, possibly within the lower parts of Thailand and uh, of course when we think of World War II we also think of the uh, the people who lost their lives and uh, toiled on the development of the Burma uh, through to Thailand Death Railway. And indeed, some of the prisoners here were from New Zealand, from Australia, and also from the UK, Great Britain. So those uh, prisoners here, they were used locally here in, in Thailand, in Chiang Mai, uh, at this field hospital, as, as labour, and they were said to drive the Japanese around. In addition to this being a working temple, and indeed uh, when I came here on one occasion trying to do this video, uh, there was a funeral here, so it was a, a very busy uh, location. But today it's much quieter. And uh, this building uh, is the real reason we've come here today. Uh, it's a museum. And at the front there are some um, small monuments with some inscriptions and some plaques, but there are two flags, the Japanese and the Thai. And inside this uh, building here at, the, at uh, Wat Muen San, uh, there is an area dedicated to the Japanese uh, memorabilia that were left over from the, uh, the period of the war. And in there you can see many photographs, uh, artifacts, uh, clothing. Uh, obviously artwork as well and uh, <laughs> strangely lots of uh, banknotes and apparently there was also a printing press left here according to uh, uh, our presentation this morning. Uh, the banknotes were made here and 
many uh, that we see today in second-hand stores uh, with no serial numbers uh, are originally printed at this location. As I say, I have been here before trying to make this video um, and this dear chap that uh, is banging away in the background uh, destroyed my uh, other attempts to um, record and talk uh, in the location in front of the uh, in front of the museum there. So I'm going to move away because it's doing my head in. He is busy working, manufacturing uh, some metalware for the new uh, building, the new uh, temple building that's here. Uh, a new art gallery, maybe you'd refer to it as, uh, but definitely a, um, a structure um, similar to uh, a small vihan. So this gentleman has a design, a drawing, and that's placed on this aluminium um, sheeting. And uh, here you'll see him following that design and applying the, the knocking pressure to uh, create the embossed design. And uh, this is one that was done earlier. And this building here is a new uh, temple building, uh, new Vihan, Vihara going up, uh, constructed of the same material and uh, being decorated by the hands of these people who are passionately knocking out the embossed aluminiums. I want to talk to you about what also is in this building over here. In the museum there are the relics of or the artifacts of the Japanese who um, were using this temple as a prisoner of war and field hospital. But to the side of that there are some templates and I use the inverted um, you know, the, the, the commas, the air commas, uh, speech marks to say these are templates that were created by ancestors of people who live in this area now. Now, the silversmiths who came here under King Kawila uh, back in the 1800s, early 1800s, they made uh, some designs of uh, products, of items, of daily use and also ceremonial use, um, but items of silver and also lacquerware and early uh, creations of those are to be seen in, in, that, uh, in that museum. And they're said that they were templates for the use of future uh, people to actually then copy. And indeed we see them in many shops today. Well, King Kawala, uh, I mentioned there, he brought people here to this city of Chiang Mai to repopulate it. Uh, he was actually tasked with the repopulation, the bringing up of uh, Chiang Mai as a city again in the north uh, by the King of Siam. So he was tasked with this 
job of uh, making it more prosperous. Uh, because prior to Cowila coming along, between the 15 and 1700s, uh, it had been decimated by the Burmese. The Burmese had ravaged the north of Thailand and indeed Chiang Mai was just a desolate, uh, barren place. So Kawala went west and as his predecessor uh, King Mengrai did, he brought people into the north of Thailand to populate uh, the region. Like uh, Meng Rai, he bought silversmiths, and uh, those silversmiths came from a village on the west side of the Salawine. And there's a lovely plaque. Uh, if you are halfway down the Wurlai Road, where the Saturday market is, uh, if you read the English version of that, it'll tell you about the, uh, the, the ox uh, that's um, standing there and the reason the ox is there and the legend of the ox, uh, which is a very interesting story. I'll let you read it for yourselves uh, if you can visit it. It's a, a, a very nice legend. And the, and, and the uh, plaque there explains that Wurlai, in actual fact, was a village in Ban Wurlai, was a village over in the Shan states. Uh, you know, uh, Sipsong Panna people were uh, brought here from their home and they brought that name with them. So Wurlai comes from uh, their hometown. And the, the many regions that were, uh, were brought here from the Shan states, the many communities, I should say, were brought here, many of them were craftsmen of silver, of lacquerware, of wood, uh, and other materials. And therefore, that's why Wurlai now is a silver-related uh, community. It says here the Sutta Jito uh, art gallery is adapted architecture of Lana. It was built as a symbol of Wurlai village, uh, as the silverware village. There are three statues of the great monks inside uh, Sutta Jito art gallery, as well as metal embossed pictures showing the history of the temple and Murnsan village. Uh, it took eight years to, to construct. It started in 2002 and is celebrated during February the 15th to the 20th, uh, 2010. 10 million baht was used to build it. Wow, 10 million baht to create this very, very beautiful, magnificent metal gallery stroke sala. And uh, it is a fascinating looking building and here's a guy an unusual uh, temple wall statue a guy dressed in fairly traditional clothes of perhaps wartime and offering robes to monks it looks like a military uniform doesn't it and uh, he's offering robes to monks unlike the uh, peaceful beauty of the angelic statues that we normally see adorning the walls around temples. Well, as can be seen from many temples around Thailand, representations of stupas at various temples around Thailand, and there are significances with the animals that you can see below uh, at the foot of the stupa, uh, the chedi. Uh, these represent uh, people's month of being born. So around Thailand you have a, a, a temple with a stupa that is representative of your birth month. And uh, here, boshed out, banged out of uh, a, an aluminium alloy uh, metal are these incredible sights of stupas. Now all of these plaques are made of the same material and uh, each one tells a story. Uh, the stories of historic events that happened here in Chiang Mai, things that have uh, stayed in people's memories and mark auspicious occasions of people arriving 
at the city or here remembering a tradition. My favourite is this one with Krubar City Chai and the workers establishing the road to Doisutep. And uh, the other large uh, created mur mural here uh, depicts the journey of the Buddha's relics uh, being transported up the mountain. And here we see one stage of the, the journey, uh, a loft on the elephant and the, the track going up the mountain. And then we see the, the track weaving on up and then further on up we see the elephant once again being followed, carrying aloft the relics. And up in the distance is the place where they deposited the relics in Wat Platet Doi Sutep. It's a lovely scene, I think. It's, uh, you know, I mean... For me, loving elephants, it's cruel to make that elephant walk there with that procession and that on its back. But this is reality, this is history, this is telling stories about what has gone on over time and how people feel about it. Yeah, beautiful. In front of these metal temple buildings, uh, we see here a metal statue uh, in a metal statue plinth area and this is the uh, very very famous Klubar Sidichai, the highly respected monk who uh, actually uh, was involved in the restoration of this temple uh, at an earlier uh, period back in the 30s. He is so renowned in the north and if you uh, haven't watched my video from a few days ago, which was the run by the uh, Chiang Mai University Freshie uh, students up to Doi Sutep. Um, I request that you do so. Uh, he appears a couple of times in that, uh, in that video. Now I've brought you over here uh, to show you this pagoda because it's rather special, because it is developed, uh, redesigned and holds the uh, essence of the Tai Yai people who came here from uh, across the other side of the Salawin forced uh, immigration to Chiang Mai by King Kawila. Uh, but I've also brought you here to see this small shrine here on the uh, front left hand side. Uh, it actually contains, uh, it's a, called a relic shrine of the great monk uh, Si. Sibichai. After the monk Sibichai passed away, his disciples div divided his relics for containing them in multiple sacred relic places. It was expected to be contained at Sun Dok Temple, but that was under construction. So it was saved at Muen San Temple. Because there was a lack of contact between Muen San and Sun Dok, the abbot of Muen San Temple and villagers designed a place to contain the relics of the great Krubar City Chai, uh, in interning them in this small pagoda here. And apparently this was in May 1953. In front there's a lovely sign which explains in English uh, that the pagoda in Lana style, mixed with Tai Yai style, was reconstructed in 1922 through to 27. And it was built by Tai Yai skillful craftsmen. So these are people who were brought here in the 1800s to repopulate the area by Karila and uh, bring their skills, their craftsmanship with them. And the pagoda is specially created with the lions on the four sides. You can see on each corner there is an umbrella. This umbrella here, and there's one on each of the four corners. Uh, in actual fact, is a, a, a specific um, trait of the Tai Yai design of a pagoda. 
Well, the field hospital uh, ran for several years here, uh, from 41-ish through to 45. And many of the troops that were in the battle uh, trying to push through the West, through to Burma, through to India, uh, retreated to here to receive um, to receive uh, treatment at the hospital. Obviously, we've got a, a runway which delivered them. We've got a, uh, a, a thoroughfare through the mountain area. Hence, this is geographically um, advantageous to the Japanese because of the route through where the rivers come through. The Saloween comes in uh, just south of Hot. Those troops were coming back here and were receiving treatment here. But on the 15th of August, uh, 1945 when the Japanese surrendered to the Allied forces. Um, many of the Japanese that were here uh, who hadn't died from their, 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 their wounds uh, committed suicide, committed uh, harakiri. And those memorial stones uh, are placed over a mass grave. Now if you can imagine the way Thai people are today, the way Thai people uh, are so helpful and kind and friendly and warm, well, that didn't happen overnight. That is part of Thai-ness that's gone on for centuries. Buddhism has grounded these people to be that way. So, in December 1941, when the Japanese gave the Thai people uh, an ultimatum to either be with us or against us and therefore lose their lives or be um, commandeered to be with us, that must have come really, really hard. You know, to have a foreign power say that you will be in a war against uh, the, you know, the Western forces, be in a war against your own will and have your country occupied by a, you know, a foreign power. That must have been absolutely crushing, crushing. But there's a lovely little story that Jack Eisner Professor Jack Eisner told us at the presentation and, and he showed us around here and um, helped us understand it a bit. And that is of uh, the Tanner, Tanner Pong family and uh, a young boy, his name is, I've got to read this, Orochun, uh, of a young boy called Orochun uh, Tanner Pong and his family helping the soldiers that were um, that were kept prisoner here. The Tanapong family took it upon themselves and uh, Orochun specifically was the, the messenger uh, bringing, uh, smuggling cigarettes, smuggling medicines and uh, foreign news uh, to the prisoners of war. Now, as I've said, the prisoners here were Australian, New Zealand and British. So therefore they must have really, really uh, welcomed that outside assistance uh, to receive um, some care. You know, it couldn't have been easy for a lot of Thai people, could it? Not just those people, but many Thai people must have felt an awful, awful pressure because it was against their will, but also against their way of life. Now the story of the Tanapong family uh, actually uh, is based around that water tower that's there today and on the left hand side at the foot of that there is a, a very old well. Apparently it, uh, it goes back 100 plus years uh, in age and uh, that's where the story of the uh, young boy bringing a basket of uh, relief of medicines, bringing some relief to the uh, prisoners here. And Jack explains the story here that uh, this well was the place, uh, one of several uh, wells within the compound, but this one was the one to be used for drawing water from the ground. And 
the history in the bricks there is um, unimaginable, isn't it? But this well was where the uh, prisoners would come to collect the water in what were called jerry cans by Jack. And uh, the family of this boy and the boy would leave a basket of medicine, cigarettes, Farang news, uh, anything to be of help to the prisoners that were inside here and uh, you know, bring them some hope. Well, this morning, Jack Eisner showed us a presentation of some slides, including uh, a slide of the uh, Tanapong family. And along with that, there was a plaque uh, which showed 46 names, uh, including uh, a private spurdle. And apparently, uh, the private spurdle uh, was attached to the uh, East Surrey uh, 2nd Battalion. And uh, the two, f two items in that slide, the photo on the left and the plaque on the right, um, are um, shown courtesy of the uh, Surrey um, History Department. Well, I contacted them and I said, can you tell me anything more about it? And they said, no, we don't have anything on record about this. So um, I'm not sure as to how I can give any more information about those two um, items. But thankfully, Jack has hung on to it and uh, it, it has been very useful for uh, bringing us that little uh, anecdote, that little story about uh, the uh, family showing um, showing care for the prisoners here. Interestingly, uh, this temple uh, was built in the 1400s. The main temple that people think of when they're in the Saturday market, which is what Si Supan, that is a grand, highly visible and ornate uh, silver, air quotes again, uh, temple. In actual fact, it was only built um, you know, in the 30s, uh, earlier uh, th in the last century. So it, it is by far no means as old as this. But moreover, this temple is more special because we've got Krubar Sirichai here, but it's also very special because it's, uh, there are the memories here in turn in the museum here under the uh, monuments there of the Japanese and the people who lost their lives in this um, in, in this prison of war camp or in this um, in this field hospital of what Muen San. Well, thank you for joining me here one week after the excursion that we made here with Payat Lifelong Learning, uh, the World War II history excursion, uh, along with Green uh, Evergreen uh, Tours and also Professor Jack Eisner. I hope through this video, which is part two uh, of the video, uh, part one was a visit to um, Wing 41 and Tango Squadron, where we visited the aircraft museum. Uh, I hope that you can see the benefit of uh, uh, attending some of these courses with lifelong learning. I'll leave uh, a link in the description below uh, hopefully to encourage you to sign up for their newsletter and also to maybe join some of their uh, their tours, some of their, um, their sessions they hold at uh, the university. Incidentally, uh, a few weeks ago, I went on a fantastic uh, trip, just a couple of hours, with uh, lifelong learning out to Fort Cowila, and opposite Fort Cowila, on the bank of the river, uh, there is a museum dedicated to King Kawila and we were fortunate uh, to have uh, the great mind of uh, the uh, museumologist Rebecca Weldon uh, with us and along with the hosts from Fort Kawila they opened up uh, the museum and showed us both sides, the, the family stuff and the personal stuff uh, that is in there. Uh, and it's really very, very interesting. And you come away feeling that you've learned so much more because you've been able to see it and not necessarily touch it so much as it's been in front of you rather than in a book or on a 
on a video like this or, uh, you know, you, 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 you've seen it on the internet. It's been in front of you and it's, you've spoken to knowledgeable people about it. So I, I wholeheartedly uh, recommend that you contact uh, PyApp Lifelong Learning and sign up for something because I think you'll enjoy it. If you've watched this, I hope you'll enjoy that. So otherwise you'd be pretty bored, wouldn't you? Now, in the first video I did of Wing 41, I thought that this second ver uh, uh, episode was going to be the final. But I think now I've got to do a third one. So next week I'll be releasing a third episode in this series, which will end the series. So number one, two and three. And that will be based out at Lampun and will finalise at uh, Mare Wang, uh, where, the, uh, where we visited a week ago now. Uh, the memorial of the Japanese uh, s soldiers and also the huge bell that was uh, dedicated by the emperor uh, from Japan. Anyway, thank you for watching this again. I hope you enjoyed it. Plenty of detail in the description below and uh, I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Take care. Bye-bye. Well, this guy's really adventurous. He's going in there for the kill. He's going in there to have a look where the bullets hit the metalwork. And uh, we've got a diagram from a website uh, that uh, we were pointed to to explain to us where the bullets hit the bridge. And uh, therefore, this is evidence. This is something factual. It brings it home to you about that war. And when you see the holes in steel and the you know, the damage that's here, that you, can, you, you can literally just, you know, reach out and touch it. coming down across this field, it's breaking up, it's somersaulting, it's in a ball of fire.